Good uh, morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Sandro Galea. I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to this public health conversation. These public health conversations are spaces for us to come together to discuss the forces that shape health. Together, we welcome speakers who guide us as we discuss, debate, and sharpen our thinking in pursuit of a healthier world. Thank you for joining us for today's event. In particular, thank you to the Dean's Office and our marketing communications team, without whose efforts these conversations would not take place. As we speak, the people of East Palestine, Ohio, are facing potential health risks from the derailment of a train carrying hazardous materials. While we are still learning about the causes and handling of the crash, the emergency has called into question the regulatory framework of the freight rail industry and the corporate practices of Northern and Southern, the company in charge of operating the train. Such moments remind us of the role the commercial sector plays in shaping the health of populations. From the food we eat to the quality of our environment to cultural attitudes towards a range of behaviors that affect health, the private sector is significant influence on the health of populations. However, systematic study of this influence remains a relatively new focus area of research. I recently had the privilege of building on previous work and working on a new book, The Commercial Determinants of Health, co-edited with Professors Nason Mani and Mark Pettigrew. The book aims to synthesize and move the field forward. Today, we're joined by some of the colleagues who contributed to the book for a conversation about how we can better understand and engage with the commercial determinants of health. I'm going to turn the event over to today's moderator. Nick Florco is the commercial determinants of health reporter for STAT, reporting on how business decisions affect public health. Nick joined STAT in 2018 as a Washington correspondent and was the former author of the DC Diagnosis Newsletter. He previously covered the Food and Drug Administration and drug pricing for Inside Health Policy. I look forward to learning from him today, along with learning from all our other speakers. Nick, thank you for joining us. Over to you. Thanks so much, Dean Galea. Uh, I'm thrilled to be moderating this discussion. As Dr. Galea mentioned, my name is Nick Florco, and I'm STAT's first reporter on the commercial determinants of health. And I couldn't think of a better or more important time to be having this discussion, both because I'm eager to talk to all of these scholars about their chapters in, in this fantastic new book that I've learned a lot from, um, but also because I think it's safe to say that public health is, is at a crossroads coming out of the COVID-19 pandemic. In the last few years, we've seen violent backlash to public health policies, but also more discussion than ever about the importance of health policy and health equity. And we've seen, too, a push to the national discourse towards building back better out of the pandemic, but also even greater inequalities and uh, corporate concentration. And so with that, I'm really looking forward to hearing from these experts today about the state of research into the commercial determinants of health and what's next for the field, especially here in the United States. Um, so we're going to hear brief remarks from all of the speakers, and then I'm going to pop back in to moderate a discussion on what we just heard and on the state of the field more generally. I encourage the audience also to ask questions in the Q&A feature on Zoom. I uh, would love to get to some of those questions as well. And so with that, I'm going to stop talking and introduce our distinguished panel. So first, we're going to hear from Dr. Salma Abdallah. Dr. Abdallah is a Sudanese medical doctor uh, and is an assistant professor in global health and epidemiology at Boston University School of Public Health. She was the director of the Rockefeller, uh, Rockefeller Boston University 3D Commission on Commercial Determinants of Health, Data Science and Decision Making. She also served as a secretariat member for the WHO Independent Panel for Pandemic Preparedness and Response during the COVID-19 pandemic. And her research focuses on understanding how microsocial forces shape the health of the population. In particular, she studies how data on the social, economic, and commercial determinants of health can be used to inform decision-making on health and health equity in different contexts. Dr. Abdallah also studies the effects of trauma on global population mental health. Next, we're going to turn to Lisa Barrow. Dr. Barrow is a professor of medicine and public health and chief scientist at the Center for Bioethics and Humanities at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus. She's a leader in evidence synthesis, meta-research, and studying commercial determinants of health, focusing on tobacco control, pharmaceutical policy, and public health. And she provides international leadership from multidisciplinary teams that specialize in studying the quality, use, and implementation of research for health and health policy. She's also the editor, uh, senior editor of research integrity for the Cochrane Collaboration and was co-chair of the Cochrane Governing Board from 2014 to 2018. Then we will hear from Dr. Nicholas Freudenberg. Dr. Freudenberg is a distinguished professor of public health at the City University of New York School of Public Health and faculty director of Healthy CUNY, which is a university-wide effort to promote the health of CUNY students to support their academic success. 
He's also a senior faculty fellow and co-founder of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, and his research examines the impact of food and social policies on urban food environments and health inequalities, strategies to bring the health Strategies to bring the health, social, and economic benefits of a college education to more students from a low income, Black, Latino, and immigrant communities, and public health approaches to reduce the harmful influences of the commercial terms of health. And finally, we will turn to May Van Schalwick. Dr. Van Schalwick is a specialty public health registrar and National Institutes for Health and Healthcare Research Doctoral Fellow at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Previously, Dr. Van Schalwick served as an NIHCR academic fellow from 2016 to 2019. Her research aims to, uh, aims to forward understanding on how commercial and structural determinants affect health and health equity, and how the activities of corporate actors influence ideas, knowledge, public discourse, and policy debates. So with that, uh, first of all, you all have <laughs> very long titles, a very distinguished panel, as you can tell. So uh, I'm going to catch my breath, and I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Abdallah. Please let me know if you can see the slides. Great. I think you can see that. Well, um, thank you, everyone, um, and thank you for inviting me to, to join today and talk about our chapter. It always feels like speaking about low- and middle-income countries is an afterthought to a lot of those conversations, so I'm happy that we're starting with uh, low- and middle-income countries today. Uh, my goal in the next few minutes is really to make an argument for the pressing need to discuss and include the low-, low and middle-income countries in our conversations about the commercial determinants of health, particularly in today's interconnected world. So I know um, my colleagues here will speak more about the concept of commercial determinants of health and what does that mean? And they will have more expertise to speak about it. But because I'm presenting first, I thought I should just first ground my presentation in the definition the World Health Organization uses for commercial determinants of health. And in, at the WHO, Commercial determinants of health are often referred to as the private sector activities that affect people's health either positively or negatively. Um, so why should we care about discussing low and middle income countries when it comes to the commercial determinants of health? It is largely because low and middle income countries are increasingly become, are becoming more consumers of global goods. For example, you can see here in this graph, uh, emerging markets, which are a share of, um, they're part of the, uh, the low middle income countries that are not necessarily all of middle income countries, but they're part of them. Their share of the global market of goods in general has increased substantially from the year 2000, which uh, was about 15% to almost 30% in the year 2020. Consumption of goods um, and particularly packaged goods has, has increased substantially in low income countries. So it's not just good, it's goods that affect health outcomes. And as you can see here from this graph, while generally speaking, people in high income countries are consuming more packaged goods, uh, the rate of increase has been much higher among low and middle income countries. So let's just, for example, look here, if you can see on the right, um, soft drinks, which are represented in red color, uh, the consumption um, increased from 1997 to 2015 by 2.4% 2 in high income countries, while on the left of the screen here, it increased um, among low and income countries by 5.2%, which is much higher rate than, low than higher income countries, especially given uh, the knowledge we have that there, there are way more people in low and income countries that are, than there are in high income countries. Now, Knowing all of this, what makes low and income countries uniquely vulnerable to commercial determinants of health? Now, being from a low and income countries, I have to say that they're not monolith. Um, I, this is always a caveat that we should have when we speak about low uh, LMICs, but I do think there are three factors that when we look at the differences from, between high income countries and low income countries that make low and income countries uniquely vulnerable to the commercial determinants of health. First, globalization and power imbalances that have been increasing over the past few decades really put low and income countries at as an advantage when it comes to the increasing power of multinational corporations or MNICs, which are often based in high income countries and that exert power in different countries across the globe. For example, and this is a slide from Oxfam. Um, Oxfam conducted a report a few years ago that looked into what type of corporations and what type of entities impact food consumption in different countries. And they found that 
less than 500 corporations globally, most of them are multinational corporations, shape the health and the food consumption of more than 70% of the global population. Most of those people, again, are in low and income countries. Now, this is just one example of why I think it's important to speak about the uh, power imbalances when it comes to multinational corporations, governments in high income countries, and then governments and consumers in low and income countries. And this is always fascinating to me. Um, this is a screenshot. If you go now to the uh, website of the Distilled Spirits Council in the United States, you will see that in 2006, they published a blog that urged Congress to accept Vietnam's admission to the World Trade Organization. Uh, because it would uh, because they reduced the tariffs they had on spirits, which meant that corporations in the U.S. can actually go and operate in Vietnam. Now, on its face, that looks fine, but the background story is that Vietnam had actually um, presented their application to the World Trade Organization, which was then blocked by the government of the United States after entities in, uh, commercial entries in the U.S. actually lobbied them to do that. And because of the US uh, dispute of the membership of Vietnam, Vietnam actually then repealed their tariffs when it comes to international corporations actually um, importing uh, alcohols to Vietnam. After Vietnam removed the tariffs, then the distilled, um, the distilled spirits council lobbied Congress to then accept Vietnam's entry to the world to the World Trade Organization. So as you can see here, we have a revolving door where interests of commercial actors in high-income countries, coupled with interests of governments in high-income countries, who, who have immense power because of either the aid they provide to low-income countries or the strengths they have when it comes to. Uh, international trade uh, agreements, we have a revolving door in, pow in, in power imbalances that then leads to pressuring low and middle income countries into taking on commercial agreements that are not in the best of interest of their citizens. This is just one example. We have multiple examples of other um, of other ways high income countries coupled with multinational corporations pressured low and income countries into trade agreements. Now, another factor, I think, in addition to those global factors, um, shapes how commercial actors can act in low income countries are the, the regulatory and the infrastructure issues we have in low income countries. So truthfully, a lot of low and income countries do not have the regulations and the taxation infrastructure that would allow them to be able to um, have a real say in what gets imported to the country and how all of those um, imports, either uh, food, uh, soft drinks or packaged food um, can be consumed within the country. So this is just one example here from a review that was done by the World Bank that showed that low and income countries, and you can see here from this figure, those countries, uh, different levels of income in each of those countries, but generally speaking, low and income countries just do not have uh, enough regulations when it comes to anything related to food and food consumption. Uh, one example I always like to look at is the fact that when it comes to veterinary uh, regulations for drugs and bio, 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 biological material, almost all low and middle income countries do not have enough regulations to actually deal with uh, any imports or even um, local consumption. Now, the last component that really affects how low and income countries uh, should be looked into when it comes to commercial determinants of health is the economic reality in each one of those countries. Now, we know from the literature that generally economic growth and you know, economic prosperity is generally associated with better population health. So for a lot of those countries, it's now a trade-off between thinking about the potential economic prosperity that comes from opening up to commercial entities coupled at the same time with the potential negative impact that would come from opening up to multinational corporations and how to regulate, regulate those multinational corporations given that a lot of LMICs do not have the regulatory forces needed to actually regulate those entities. Now, those are the three forces that I, I, I continue thinking about, keep it, keeping in mind that a lot of the conversation we have on commercial determinants of health is linked then to non-communicable diseases. And more than two thirds of communicable diseases that happen across the world actually happen in low and income countries, which makes them then severely vulnerable when it comes to the consequences 
of, uh, of not addressing the commercial determinants of health. Keeping all of that in mind, I would propose two, uh, two areas for us to focus on when we discuss a path forward when it comes to the commercial determinants of health discourse and practice. So the first one is that addressing power imbalances at the global level should be central to our commercial determinants of health scholarship. Um, much of the conversation we have right now on commercial determinants of health is really focused on high income countries, but I do think we need to engage more with how trade agreements, how global power imbalances and structures actually shape commercial determinants of health. The second component is really the need to invest in commercial determinants of health scholarship that is focused on the unique conditions in different low income countries. This means that we need to engage in activities that would support local actors in a low income country that would have clear understanding of the trade offs between the need for economic prosperity and support for private entities to within a country with the potential harm that comes from not addressing the commercial determinants of health. Um, I think that's the last thing I would say here is that this is a new and, um, and really interesting field to emerge uh, when it comes to global population health. And I think it's one of the few times that we have an opportunity to actually frame a field from the beginning to look into the global population rather than focusing on high income countries and then at the end, adding low income countries and as an afterthought. This is my email and I'm happy to start the discussion. Thanks so much, Dr. Abdallah. Uh, now we're gonna turn to Dr. Barrow. Great, thank you. Uh, great presentation. Um, let's see if I can get this right. Great, I'm gonna actually really switch gears. We're gonna have so much to cover in the discussion here because I just wanna focus on one particular aspect of commercial determinants of health here, which is uh, commercial or private sector influence on research itself and, and health research. And so, you know, why do we care about this? I, I feel so strongly we need to care about commercial influence on research because we hope that research will play a role in public health policy development. Obviously, it's only one part of that, but when you think about it, if how we ask research questions, how we design the studies, conduct them and report them, if any of these aspects uh, fall down, then the whole tower of evidence uh, falls down. We don't have trustworthy evidence. We don't have good systematic reviews. We don't have health guidelines. We don't have public health policies that are based on evidence. So I think it's been really critical over the years to explore how private interests have influenced the evidence on which we make decisions. So what we're really worried about in terms of this influence is bias. So what do we mean by bias? This is one definition from Cochrane, but it's a commonly used definition. And bias is a systematic error or deviation from the truth in the results of a study. It's important to note that a bias can over or underestimate an effect. And so, for example, if you're thinking of uh, whether a drug works or not, whether it's effective, uh, you don't want that to be overestimated. If you're looking at harm from a chemical in the environment, you don't want that to be underestimated. So it's important to know that the bias can go in either direction. So what we want to find out here is does commercial sponsorship of research or conflicts of interest or financial ties of researchers, is that associated with bias in the results of studies? So I, uh, Nick mentioned, I do meta research. This is Bailey, a meta pug. So he's a pug dog wearing a pug costume and meta research is sort of like that. So we do research on research and we get something like this that doesn't look nearly as cute as a pug dog in a pug suit. But basically this is the kind of studies we do to look at a body of evidence on a particular topic and see if the findings are associated independently with the sponsor. So I'll just walk you through one of these. And this has been done by our group, by many other groups um, and on many, many different sorts of commercial sectors. So this is an example from the pharmaceutical sector. This uh, study included 25 papers with almost 3000 included studies. So that's a lot of uh, data here. And we compared drug industry sponsors to uh, other sponsors of drug studies. 
And the question here shown on this is we were asking, do studies with uh, statistically significant results that show efficacy of the drug, do those differ between those with drug industry, company sponsors, and those with other sponsors? And what we found is that overall, looking at these almost 3,000 studies, that studies with statistically significant efficacy results were about 30% higher among industry-sponsored studies comparing to the non-industry-sponsored studies. And it's important to note here that this couldn't be explained by any other differences in the studies. So basically, it was just the sponsorship that was associated with the statistical significance of the results, not something else. So there's a lot of criticisms, of course, of using statistical significance of, of results uh, as an outcome. Uh, the FDA does it, for example, but in a lot of uh, groups who make decisions do use statistical significance. But another way to look at results is effect sizes. And this, again, is just an example from a different sector in nutrition. And here we were comparing uh, three studies that had um, dairy industry uh, sponsorship to those that didn't have dairy industry sponsorship. And the question here was, does dairy consumption improve um, uh, cardiovascular disease, decrease cardiovascular disease? And what you see here when you put these studies all together is that the industry sponsored studies have a bigger effect estimate. It doesn't cross this line here of no effect than those that didn't have industry sponsorship. <clears throat> So that's just another way to look at results, effect sizes. But then we're also interested in the conclusions of studies. Uh, conclusions are very important because they're pub, um, covered in the media, they're assessed by policymakers. Um, so researchers like me are interested in results, but the conclusions are important. And this is one of the earliest studies done on this topic. There have been many, many across sectors done on conclusions. And here we looked at studies that were sponsored by the tobacco industry or not. And we wanted to see whether, uh, and these studies were reviews, whether they uh, concluded secondhand smoke was harmful or not. And basically studies that were sponsored by the tobacco industry were about 90 times more likely to conclude that secondhand smoke was not harmful than those with other sponsors. And that's when you controlled for whether the studies were peer reviewed or not, what their quality was, what the topic was, and what the year of publication was, because results could change. So that's a huge estimate. I mean, that's a huge uh, effect size, 90 times more likely. And again, so the result was associated with the sponsor. So this has actually been termed funding bias, and it's been studied across many commercial sectors. And we have an abundant amount of evidence now to show that the funding of studies, a commercial bias is associated um, with conclusions of studies, the statistical significance of studies, and the effect size of studies, all of which would favor the commercial sponsor. So we have this evidence, but this is an observation. So the real question is, well, how in the world does this happen? How do we get this bias uh, in these uh, studies? Uh, uh, done by commercial sponsors. And in my brief remarks here, I don't have time to go into this, but uh, our group and many other groups have tried to tackle this question using a whole variety of methods. One really key method has to been, uh, been to look at uh, once uh, um, confidential industry documents that were released through lawsuits. So industry, I'm sorry, tobacco industry, pharmaceutical industry, chemical industry, uh, food industry, we have lots of documents now. That tells us what's happening behind the scenes. We've also are able to look at documents that have been released to regulatory agencies of various sorts. So the regulatory agency may get more data, for example, than what's published in the literature. And so that may tell us what's happening. And then lastly, uh, just by interviewing and talking to researchers themselves about their experience with industry. So to sum up all this evidence from uh, many, many of these studies, uh, we we've, uh, call this a cycle of bias. So this is where commercial sponsors can intervene to create bias in the cycle of research. And I hope in the discussion, we have more time to go into this, but basically we have evidence that commercial sponsors affect 
the research agenda, so how the questions are actually asked, so that uh, questions that harm them may not be asked, uh, the questions can frame in a way that their intervention looks better. Uh, then there's uh, intervention, um, commercial influence on the methods of the study, so how they're actually designed. Um, and this is actually a much too bigger areas are commercial influence on how the study is conducted behind the scenes. So it may be designed well, but it may not be conducted that way. Um, and then whether the study is published in full or not. And there's a lot of evidence of selective publication of results that favor the industry sponsor. And this is important because this is a cycle and the next questions in research are then framed based on the evidence that researchers have available uh, to them. So I do hope we have time to uh, pursue more of this in the discussion, and thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrow. Uh, now we're going to turn to Dr. Freudenberg. It's a pleasure and honor to be with you all today. And in my remarks, I'd like to address three questions. First, how can we best synthesize and integrate the rapidly growing evidence on commercial determinants of health? Second, what role can social movements and activists play in changing the harmful practices and politics of commercial actors? And third, how can schools of public health and other public health, other public health training institutions educate students and faculty about commercial determinants of health? So first, let me talk about uh, synthesizing and integrating new evidence. In the first decade, of recent work on commercial determinants of health, uh, mostly the last decade, 2010 or so, 2008, uh, the primary challenge was convincing policymakers, practitioners, and researchers that commercial determinants was a useful way of thinking about public health. But I think in this decade, as we've seen really a plethora of new studies and new evidence, a sign of the success of this new line of work. The main question is how can we integrate and synthesize the numerous studies, frameworks, and lines of research? Uh, because they will only be able to guide practice, policy, and future research if we can integrate what we're learning uh, across the many studies. And I wanted to make three recommendations uh, for doing that. First, I think we need to develop models for blending the now often separate bodies of work on social determinants of health, the original model that all this came out of, uh, political determinants of health, uh, environmental determinants, as well as uh, commercial determinants, into some overarching integrative framework. In the real world, social determinants, political determinants, commercial determinants don't act separately in silos, but in tandem. And we need to develop an understanding so we can take these new insights from the various uh, research on the cause of the causes, as social epidemiologists say, and put them together. Second, I think we need to expand research that depends on practice-based evidence. Practice-based evidence comes from studying what's actually going on in the world. And I think there's a lot to learn because everywhere in the world, here in the United States, and in a different way, but also as uh, Salma talked to us about, in low and middle income countries, people are working to address commercial determinants. We need to study what's working and what's not working and how to keep doing more of what's working and less of what's not working. And third, we need to develop metrics for assessing both at the micro, macro, and meso level the impact of commercial determinants on various states of health. And there are a few researchers who have written about that, Joanna Lima and Sandra Galea, uh, Kelly Lee and uh, I and others have proposed various strategies for beginning to measure. And I think it will be useful to continue that work and to integrate it. I also think it would be useful to think about metrics in a very 
focused way. So for example, I think there's a growing consensus among food researchers that an important task for improving population health is to reduce the consumption of food and calories that come from ultra processed foods, food that is industrially produced and has high levels of fat, sugar, flavorings, etc. So how would we measure whether the food industry, in fact, is producing less ultra processed food and people are eating less of it? Those would be the kind of metrics we would need for understanding how to actually use these insights to improve population health. And as many of you probably know, ultra processed food is now regarded as the major determinant of the global burden of mortality and morbidity. Uh, certainly in high and middle income countries, increasingly in low income countries, and also here in the United States, the driver of inequities in health. So it's an important task. The second question I wanted to ask is what role can social movements and activists play in changing the harmful practices and policies of commercial actors? While multiple constituencies will need to act to change harmful corporate practices, to my mind, the evidence to date suggests that there are limits to what businesses can and will do on their own. So my feeling is that expecting business to take this on on its own is an unlikely strategy. Second, while we see heterogeneity in the roles that governments have taken on, and some are uh, in advance, we've seen some countries in Latin America taking on the food industry in a very robust way, but many governments around the world are entangled with commercial actors. And these business actors have accumulated great power in the last few decades to shape government policy and action. And therefore governments too have limits on the actions they can take to uh, protect public health against harmful commercial forces. And this leaves civil society. Uh, however, in my view, the term civil society often obfuscates rather than clarifies who the agents of change will be. And there was some discussion in the World Health Organization where they were defining uh, civil society to include business organizations that weren't themselves for profit. I don't think that makes things clearer. And I like to think about social movements and uh, activist groups. And I think in the last century, those have been the forces that have been the drivers of changes in public health practice and public health policy. So I think we need to be asking about who are the social movements that can uh, begin to put pressure on uh, commercial actors to change their practices and to encourage government to take more robust regulatory action. And I think some of the things that social movements can do are to change the public discussion and understanding of issues. So for example, my uh, group at the School of Public Health at City University of New York has been putting forth the concept of predatory marketing of unhealthy food and trying to denormalize that in the same way that uh, tobacco activists uh, a couple decades ago tried to denormalize marketing of tobacco. And through doing that, we hope to change the conversation. And in fact, now some elected officials are looking to develop legislation to limit predatory marketing in public places, particularly to children. Second, and this is a frankly political task, and some people are reluctant to in public health to enter into politics, but if we're going to take on commercial actors, that is an inherently political task. And I think we need to think about how to make elected officials fear that the cost of inaction on taking on commercial determinants are higher than the risk of acting to reduce corporate harm. So a question to talk about is how do we do that? And third, I think we need to build coalitions across issues geographies and constituencies that can accumulate the power to win over uh, commercial influences and to restrain their influence. And again, I think we've seen some big successes. The AIDS movement, where we saw cooperation between AIDS activists in South Africa and the United States to lower the cost of AIDS, and also the really the global uh, climate change movement, I think has brought some wonderful examples of people acting across borders to put pressure on the fossil fuel industry. And the last 
question I wanted to talk about is how can schools of public health educate students and faculty about commercial determinants of health? And here I want to acknowledge my colleague, uh, Eric Crosby, who wrote the chapter uh, in this new book on commercial determinants of health about uh, education about uh, in schools of public health. If public health uh, as a profession and as a discipline and as a community is going to succeed in reducing harmful commercial determinants, then we'll need to ensure that our students have the knowledge and skills to take on that challenge. And here are a few thoughts on how we might do that. We need to develop cross-cutting competencies in commercial determinants of health that identify pathways by which corporate decisions on production, marketing, and lobbying influence patterns of health and disease. Always, it was a problem when public health stayed within public health. And I think particularly as we take on commercial determinants, we need to establish academic partnerships that include shared research, teaching, and uh, community action with other disciplines, such as political science, economics, business, law, urban planning, and others. Uh, and I think we all can begin to show models for doing that. We need to create placements and internships in labor unions, environmental groups, activist organizations, socially responsible investment firms, and other sites to give our students knowledge of the worlds in which commercial determinants are shaped. And we need to hire the activists who are leading the most successful campaigns against for example, the fossil fuel industry, the food industry, the tobacco industry, the pharmaceutical industry, to teach in our schools. And we need to recruit the students who are part of these campaigns to become the public health professionals of the future. And by taking these actions in our schools, we can help move the discussion we are having today into the mainstream of public health professional education. And in the coming decade, it should become as routine for every public health professional to have skills and competencies in commercial determinants of health as in epidemiology or environmental health. Thank you. I look forward to your discussion. Thanks, Dr. Freudenberg. Uh, and now we're going to turn to Dr. Van Schelwick. Hopefully everyone, everyone can see that. Okay, so well, many thanks uh, to Sandro and Nick and um, others who were involved behind the scenes. And I'm delighted to be given the opportunity to contribute to this conversation. And I've re it's, been a, it's been a real pleasure actually to hear from my, my fellow book chapter authors. And I actually think I have um, maybe one of the most challenging roles um, of this conversation is that I have to follow these, these, these great, great presentations by experienced colleagues, um, but hopefully there's not, not too much overlap and actually reinforce some, some, some points. So in thinking about what I could bring to this conversation, I thought I would focus on the way that working in the field of the commercial determinants of health has taught me to, what's on the slide, think differently. Um, to how I did before when I worked, for example, as a scientist in a lab or as a clinical doctor in a hospital. So the types of industries and issues um, that I've been researching and reading about have shaped the way I now think and the questions that I ask about the world and the issues we face in trying to promote and protect public health. So in collaboration with my brilliant colleagues, uh, Professor Rebecca Cassidy, Dr. Nason Marni, um, and Professor Mark Pettigrew, I led on writing a chapter on the gambling industry and another on the fossil fuel industry. And both of these industries have, at least among the wider health community, um, up until recently received less attention as a, as a commercial determinants, as commercial determinants of health. And the ways they harm health um, function through, through different mechanisms to many other products and industry practices, but both the gambling and the fossil fuel industries have huge implications for public health the world over. And although they're very different from each other, the story of these two industries involves, among other practices, well-funded and multifaceted efforts to shape research agendas, what is understood about the risks associated with the use of their products, who's responsible for the harms that are arising and what needs to be done in response. 
And both of these industries have been quite very successful in this way. And while it's important to understand these strategies and how they've been enabled by others, I thought that for today, I would focus on getting us to reflect on what this means for us. So as health and research professionals and as members of the public. So in commercial determinants, um, we often focus quite rightly on studying and exposing the strategies of particular industry, of a particular industry, um, but we can also direct our attention to asking, what do these studies tell us about our own practices and ways of thinking? Um, so what do I mean by this? To answer this, I will touch on four connected points for the rest of my talk and then pass back to Nick to open up the discussion um, part of today's event, which I really look forward to. So reflecting on my own experiences upon entering, entering into the field of the commercial determinants of health and learning about all the different industries, for example, from coal, lead, asbestos, pesticides, automobiles, to tobacco, infant formula, sugar, as Nick Frodenberg was saying food, gambling and, and fossil fuels, I found I now think very differently about what shapes the world in which we live and the problems we face in public health. So this leads me to my first point, and that's the concept of problem definitions. So what I mean by this is what we define as a problem, who is responsible and what should we do about it? Sometimes we can leap into debating what to do about a public health problem. So what interventions are needed to address gambling addiction, for example, or climate change. However, adopting a commercial determinants of health lens can often reveal that we need to step back and reconsider what and who are we defining as the problem and ask why we've come to see a particular issue in a particular way and whose interests are being served by doing so. So for example, why do we talk often talk about problem gamblers, not problem gambling products or providers? Or why are we talking about carbon capture as ways to address climate change and not more about the threat posed by regulatory capture and industry influence, for example? Another key example that I often think about is about the way the automobile industry often promoted this idea of the so-called nut behind the wheel as the problem, deflecting from framing the issue as one of automobile safety or the industry's resistance to make cars safe, as Rolf Nader wrote about in his seminal book, Unsafe at Any Speed. To me, the idea of the problem gambler similarly creates an industry-friendly problem definition. And second, number two, this is linked to the importance of asking where our ideas and problem definitions come from. The way we think about a problem is often taken for granted and can feel like there is absolutely no other way to look at an issue. But many of the ways we think about issues, what we think about problems and the role of certain actors, particularly governments in addressing these, have been shaped by certain industries. So, for example, Naomi Reskes and David Conway document this in detail in their recent historical account of how businesses shape public understanding of the role of government versus the private sector. And so for decades, corporations have acted to present themselves as part of the solution, as opposed to being drivers of harm. And we can see this in the way the fossil fuel industry makes claims that they are contributing to moving away from fossil fuel dependency, but in practice they, they often represent major barriers to achieving sustainable energy transitions. This is why taking a historical perspective and having a good understanding of the very long history of commercial determinants is key. So harmful corporate practices and the ways that major corporations can influence health have a long and well-documented history. And it is important that we learn from this, just as other fields such as law, engineering or medicine draw on past experiences and, and often precedents. So I just think like, imagine if engineers or doctors didn't learn from previous endeavors to build bridges or certain or treat certain conditions. So learning from the past helps avoid preventable harm now in the future and in the future, while recognizing the new challenges that we'll face along the way. And number three, as part of this learning, we need to reflect not only on the role played by health professionals and academia in documenting and addressing the harms caused by particular commercial practices and products, but also the ways in which our professions have often facilitated them. 
So we need to be aware of how the legitimacy of academia and the health professions is used time and again by corporations to protect their interests and how our own practices can contribute in harmful ways to forwarding commercial agendas at the expense of public health. And this can happen through a number of ways, some more overt and obvious than others. For example, through reproducing certain ideas and problem definitions, as I was just saying, but it can also involve taking part in commercial efforts to influence research by accepting industry funding or conducting certain types of research as Professor Vero took us through so well and has studied for years. And in building favorable corporate images through corporate social responsibility initiatives, such as youth education and campaigns that shift blame and responsibility onto the public, something myself and colleagues have been studying quite a lot in recent years. And it is critical that we scrutinize our own conduct as much as that of the industries that we study. And number four, and finally, all these points and much of the research on the commercial determinants of health therefore have implications for what we define as a public health in intervention. And as Dr. Freudenberg was saying, the kinds of skills we need and, and in the, within the public health profession. I, so I really hope this has given us some further discussion to what we've already, discussion points to what we've already heard today. And I also look forward to really seeing where this field evolves over time. And most important to hear, hearing from the, the audience here today. So back over to you, Nick. Thank you, Dr. Van Schalwick. That was that was great. And there certainly was parallels between, uh, I was taking notes on the different parallels between what you were saying and other folks. And I'm super excited for this discussion. Um, there are already a lot of audience questions and I'm gonna mainly focus on those. But before I get to that, I had one question that I just wanted to queue up, um, which is really going back to my opening remarks and sort of this moment that we find ourselves in. Um, I was struck by something Dr. Galea wrote in one of his chapters on the book. And I'm just gonna read that really quick. He said, as we look to build back better following a global pandemic and its consequences, it is perhaps more prudent than ever to bear witness to the commercial forces that shape the world around us and by extension our health. Research on commercial determinants of health has therefore never been more relevant nor more likely to be heavily contested by a range of competing interests. Uh, that really struck me because, at least in my work as a reporter, I often hear from policy experts uh, and frankly from corporate voices about how the public, how the pandemic has increased the public's understanding about, about social determinants of health and health equity. And you know, we hear about building back better, but at the same time, we also see uh, a lot of forces going the opposite way. And so my question for the group is just a level set. I mean, where are we right now? Are we in a better place now as a society to address the commercial determinants of health than we were pre-pandemic? How has the pandemic impacted sort of the this field and sort of the ability to take on these big issues that you all are talking about? Feel free to jump right in. I'm not gonna call on names right away if people feel passionately. in uh, the, the silence, uh, maybe to get this started. I think we're really at a uh, at an inflection point. I think the model that developed over the last 50 years or so, you know, what some people call neoliberalism, the notion that markets are the primary agent for organizing society and that markets are always more efficient than governments. I think that paradigm has been profoundly challenged by the uh, by the pandemic, by the 2007 economic crisis, and by the current, you know, global economic crisis. I don't think it's yet clear whether the uh, alternative vision of a more uh, democratic, a more uh, popular control where health uh, matters more than profits, whether that alternative is, uh, is a birthing. And so I think this is a really important few years, both for those who are in activist movements and those who are in public health to put forth, you know, uh, clear analysis and also alternatives. That's a starting response. Would anybody like to add to that? I do have a follow-up question for you, Dr. Freudenberg, if not. Yeah, I can. I can just add uh, to that a little from the research perspective. I, I'm not sure we're in a better place there because 
you know, the entire research enterprise has been questioned uh, during the pandemic, and I don't think it's come out very well. Uh, people have a much lower uh, trust in science, and that trust doesn't seem to have anything to do uh, with whether the science has been commercially influenced or not. I mean, big corporate players have had opportunities to become aligned with uh, public health interest, and they have indeed at some points. Uh, but I think, you know, the, the skepticism that's been created about science in general um, during the pandemic, um, you know, might might be misplaced. Uh, it's, uh, you know, distrust of an expert, uh, not distrust of who the sponsor of the research might be. So I think I think we have a lot more work to do there to figure out um, or to keep, you know, in people's minds uh, that evidence is a good thing. And, uh, you know, what is the evidence that we can trust and what is the evidence that we need the most um, to solve public health problems? Um, if I could just quickly add to that, because I was thinking about what Nick said, and I'm not sure, I think we're in a different place. I'm just not sure if it's a better or a worse place, uh, mostly because so yes, I think there has been a focus on the issues that are facing our system, but thinking and, and just thinking about the trust issue that you just discussed, I think there is a global trust parameter that comes every year. And surprising enough, even though trust in scientists has gone down, trust in governments has gone down, trust in the private sector um, has actually, I think, either stayed the same or increased over the past few years. I don't want to miss um, uh, misrepresent that survey, but I think that's, that's a main issue of what do you mean by the private sector? And when we're talking about commercial determinants of health, um, I think for a lot of people, especially during the early days of the pandemic, their, their supervisor or like Moderna as a private entity or Pfizer, those were examples that were shown as good examples versus what the government did. So I think, I think we're going to have, we need to have way a lot more conversations about how do commercial interests actually intersect with inequities and what do we need there to, to have a shift in perspective when it comes to commercial interests, not just the shiny examples, but also, and not just your immediate supervisor, but also the enterprise in general. I was just gonna actually just add one one thing that I think was was quite interesting um, with the pandemic was that if you if you kind of looked at a lot of, of of media accounts and I think kind of lockdown and people have very very different experiences, but the, there was a I think people recognised the opportunity for change, um, and we kind of charted this a little bit with some of the stuff that we were doing, and that there was there was such a sense of hope for change. And actually, you know, there were surveys about people, you know, kind of saying, well, seeing as streets were kind of reclaimed and things in, 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 um, during lockdown. So I think that there's a, a kind of what, what um, um, Professor Frodenberg was saying, it's, it's galvanizing those kind of maybe opportunities for social movement and hope. Um, but I think the flip side of this is also thinking about commercial determinants research more generally in that context is, is that I think what's underestimated is the very well documented history of, for example, the way commercial actors really can not only kind of work constantly behind the scenes in over years to kind of build their interests, but have how much they can actually um, uh, galvanize a crisis. And I think, you know, we have a lot now, you know, we need to prepare more for pandemics, but what, we, what I don't hear as much is, is what can we learn about how corporations exploit crises to actually what I would say is kind of take 10 years worth of commercial determinants and put it on fast forward during crises and I, I think we, we we really underestimate what they get done um, in in panic mode um, which I think is really important to remember. Absolutely um, I want to move to one question um, actually just about the conceptualization of commercial determinants of health because I think it's in my experience, uh, even covering this, I talk to public health folks sometimes who still don't, you know, know what the term means or what the the field focuses on. So there is a question here, uh, someone raising uh, some concerns with the conceptualization. I'm just going to read some of it because I think it'll help us understand the question. Uh, they said, commercial determinants of health gives me pause. It feels like an economist got a hold of the idea of social determinants and wanted to subset parts of the social determinants as separate. I think it could be detrimental to the to view commercial as distinct from social, as it obscures the fact that commerce arises from social constructs. It uh, and I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna uh, abbreviate to the end. It says it very much feels like neoliberal watering down of a public health framework. 
thoughts. Uh, curious for the uh, the panelists' uh, response to some of those concerns and that conceptualization of commercial determinants of health. I, I think yeah. that's a really uh, interesting question, and uh, I think as Nick was mentioning, the um, you know there's an interplay of all of these different determinants of health. But I have to say, in the research area, I do think it's important to isolate and focus on the commercial uh, determinants, because I think every speaker has mentioned the word power, and it's all about the power. Who has the power to influence the entire evidence base that we might make decisions on? And commercial players uh, have a lot of power. And so in the, the research area where this has played out now is a lot of people are uh, writing uh, to undermine uh, basically conflict of interest policies and sponsorship policies and research to say, for example, that the background of the researcher or their personal experience or uh, some other uh, aspect of the researcher is a more important influence on the science than uh, commercial influence. And I think we have to step back there and say, well, what's the power then? Every, every researcher brings a particular background and experience and set of beliefs to their research, and that is presumably spread out among all sorts of different uh, types of researchers. But the industry uh, sponsors tend to focus on the what's of commercial interest to them and would support their bottom line. And so they have a lot of power uh, to influence the research in one direction. So I do uh, see the benefit of thinking about these as integrated. I think that's important, but I also think it's really important to focus on the commercial part itself because of the, the power held there. I think power is a really important word to talk about, but there's another word that we haven't used yet today, uh, and that's capitalism. And I think we need to be willing in public health to look at a system, a political and economic system that is now really the dominant system in the world. And whether we uh, detest, uh, embrace, or are indifferent to capitalism, if our job is to understand patterns of health and disease, we have to look at how that system influences that. And I think uh, my uh, occasional concern with the term commercial determinants of health, it's a more anodyne way, a more acceptable way uh, of, of not naming the, the dominant political system and the dominant economic system. So I think uh, within the more academic uh, public health, we've uh, embraced system science as a way of understanding public health. Well, the system that influences commercial determinants of health is capitalism. And so I think using, you know, saying the name uh, is an important step forward. But I think, uh, just to add also to that, I think as someone who works on the social determinants of health, um, I can definitely see the concern of thinking, if we're talking about commercial actors, using the term commercial determinants of health are we watering down their, their influence. And I think there, there's really good work that was done by Dr. Mani and colleague, I think, colleagues, I think, at looking at whether frameworks looking into commercial determinants of health actually look into also social determinants of health. And I think that's something that's definitely, uh, I would highly recommend for, um, for anyone who's listening today to look into. Uh, but I, I would say, especially when it comes to terms, I think my argument here would be, any term could be used to really water down the concept. I think even now the term social determinants of health, and some people have a lot of issues with that term, I think even now it's being used by different entities to the point now, I think, especially in the US, to the point of looking into individual level um, issues instead of focusing on system levels. And I think the same could happen with commercial determinants of health, especially if we're not uh, interrogating power dynamics. I do think, um, why I like this concept and the idea that we're starting to, to talk about commercial determinants of health in public health is that for a long time, even when we talk about social and political determinants of health, the role that is almost always there of commercial actors and how they shape political decisions and social decisions is just never acknowledged. And I do think just talking about commercial determinants of health provide that avenue to engage with, with, with the power those commercial actors have. 
Yeah, and I, I would just add, I mean, I think these are fantastic questions because I, I think kind of com coming right back to, to Salma's point right at the beginning, it's it's really important that we kind of don't lock ourselves in, like this is a new field and we need to kind of make it that we also it, let it bring in many different different um different viewpoints and different ideas. And I, so I think, yeah, what we don't want to do is just kind of cookie cutter from what we had before, because I think it's an opportunity to think differently, which is what I was making the point. Um, and, and I think the other thing to, to I think never lose sight of, 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 of context. Um, Professor Fernandez was talking about like kind of much bigger, um, you know, larger kind of context and forces, but, you know, the same at the same time as thinking about the, the kind of specific um, problem or, or industry is also really important to think about the, the, the context. And I think what comes to mind with gambling is, you know, you can talk about gambling industry, but often that might actually be the government. So it's, it is really important to kind of also think about the specifics that you're thinking that you're talking about and the way that those commercial actors are, are influencing health, I suppose. It's what is the most useful way of thinking about the commercial elements felt in that context, in that problem, that is going to help you understand how it's actually influencing health as well, and not not kind of bracketing it out as a black and white definition. Uh, Dr. Abdallah, I wanted to turn to you because there's a, a number of questions coming into the chat uh, for you. The first is um, actually sort of a comment, but I'm hoping you can you can uh, comment on it. So. I'm just going to read it. It says the, the picture of commercial determinants of health in low and, min, low and middle income countries is honestly, in my opinion, incomplete without considering the context of colonialism and imperialism. Facilitating these commercial activities left so many countries with poor regulation or the inability to set them because of these longstanding influences. Um, so I was hoping, Dr. Bell, you might be able to speak a little bit to what role the history of colonialism has played in sort of shaping the commercial determinants of health in low and middle income countries. <sighs> Oh, definitely. I do not want to go on a long tangent, so stop me <laughs> before I do that. But uh, I do think it plays a large role, if not, um, if not um, completely being responsible for the power imbalances we have today. I think I think colonialism and imperialism is why we have. Uh, I'm from Sudan. Why we have a, a very weak regulatory um, government in Sudan because. The British uh, government, when they came to Sudan, they actually systematically worked in a way to make sure that when they leave, we don't have really a strong infra infrastructure or system that is capable of addressing the different challenges that come with globalization. So I think I think that is almost always going to be a big part of the conversation. That also comes through in the power imbalances when we when we talk about the World Trade Organization, how it's being set up, um, who gets the power in those trade organizations to actually. Uh, be able to uh, do um, stop the nomination of one country compared to another. So I do I do think imperialism and colonialism are are almost always part of the conversation when we talk about commercial determinants of health globally. Um, I think it, it would be a mistake not to talk about them, but I think at the same time we see their uh, their impact so um, clearly in all the power imbalances today that I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that we reach a point where everyone should know and be clear about their role uh, when it comes to global population health, not just commercial determinants of health. Uh, one perhaps related question that stuck out to me also is, uh, again, for you, Dr. Abdallah, I was what, uh, wondering what seems to be the root cause of the increase of product use in low and middle income countries. Um, so I don't want to speculate on this because I'm not sure there's a lot of research in this out there, but um, at, at least to my mind, from what I've seen, there seem to be two issues here. So the first one is just a lot of income countries are increasingly growing economically. And when you have a, a new market and you have globalization, of course, different entities and different corporations are going to invest in, in those markets. Uh, the other component, which I would love to see more research on, is um, this hypothesis of whether... Um, when high income countries have more regulations, it's much easier than for international and uh, multinational corporations to do work or to uh, to sell their products in non income countries. This is not this is this is so far, I think, a hypothesis. I'm not sure there is a lot of out there in the literature to actually support that, but that would be something to definitely look into. And then I'm going to put you on uh, the spot for one more, and then I promise I'll move on, which is just what advice would you give to low and middle income countries on commercial determinants of health? That came from the audience as well. 
Oh, wow, advice to the all low income countries. <laughs> that it doesn't specify if it's uh, specific actors or or not. But if you have advice for the the academics or for government, I, either way, I think might be helpful. Sure, I, th I think it's a very difficult um, question to just put to low and income countries. I think just speaking about the power imbalances as we discuss in colonialism and imperialism, I think it's very difficult to go now to a low and income country and say, and I think this is part of the conversation when it comes to climate change as well. You know what, we're in a very difficult place right now globally. We need you to stop growing or we need you to not provide goods for your country. I think we need to move beyond that to an actual global conversation and say, why do we have people in different parts of the world who do not have access to the same level of, um, of different determinants of health, housing, food security, and what can we do as a global community to address that instead of going to a low income country now after all of the power imbalances that we've been go going through and say, you need to figure this out. I think we reached a point where we need to actually have a global conversation. Do any of the panelists want to comment on those remarks before I move on to another topic? Seeing no one unmuting, I'm going to move on for the sake of time. Um, I see two questions that I think are related and are quite interesting, which are sort of how the field essentially can work with corporations um, to address commercial determinants of health. So the first one is what role can or does corporate ESG policies play in addressing commercial determinants of health? And then the second is... In the, uh, in the common carrot and stick analogy, what are some carrot examples of how to get corporate interests to care about mitigating the deleterious health impacts in their industry slash company might have? So yeah, I'm curious for the audience's take on sort of whether corporations have a role here to play, I guess. Dr. Ford, but you spoke uh, passionately about capitalism, so I'm gonna call on you. Sure. And I think uh, my read of the evidence is a, a, a growing body of evidence on what are called uh, public-private partnerships, uh, a lot around public health, uh, where corporations and health agencies will work together. Uh, it's happened here in the United States and Europe. And my broad read of that evidence is it's very mixed, that corporations will sometimes choose to enter such partnerships when they're riding on a wave, when things are already changing in their direction and they, and they actually are not making changes that would jeopardize profits. And also we've seen examples where industries have uh, taken health enhancing measures, uh, some automobile companies to produce more environmental friendly cars. And then when the economics change, they drop that line and go back to the SUVs and the heavily polluting vehicles because they're more profitable. Uh, but I don't think it's a moral question of whether we work with corporations or not. It's a very practical question. And I get a little impatient with my public health colleagues when they promote uh, corporate public health partnerships in what I regard as uh, faith-based efforts, you know, just because they think it's good for uh, public health folks and corporations to be talking to each other. I say, you know, show the evidence that uh, we should try those things out. And in some cases, it might lead to uh, beneficial impacts. The, the weight of the evidence, as I said, is, is not that. But I think what we have seen is when uh, government and civil society puts pressure on corporations, they change. And so I think that is the strategy and that can be done in more and less adversarial ways. Again, there's nothing inherently good about adversarial strategies towards business, it's what works. And if there are incentives where uh, businesses feel like they will make more money by following healthful practices and uh, lower their risks of losing money, that's a good thing and we should figure out how to do that. And maybe some of my colleagues can give some more specific examples of that from their own work. Well, there a lot of action has been happening on this uh, with the research funding uh, area. And I think that uh, you know the, there's been tons of progress in terms of transparency around funding, but that doesn't solve the problem, right? And so, 
Uh, there are many, many models to try to ensure there's independence from the corporate sponsor's uh, influence. And uh, I mean, you know, the, the examples we've all heard these, you know, there's consortia of funding uh, funders, but then the corporate uh, funders pull out. I've had many, many experiences with this at various universities. You know, they pull out because they lose their power over the research then if they're, you know, part of a consortia and not funding uh, specific research projects. And so I think, you know, for all of, there's many, many models out there to try to promote um, partnerships around research funding. And I think it's just really important to think about what are the aspects of that model that would ensure uh, independence. You know, people have tried contracts, but then actually those don't really, you know, um, protect the independence of researchers uh, in many instances. So, so that's the thing to look at those particular uh, aspects of the the framework. And frankly, you know, all I've seen that really, really works is to uh, have the funding be completely separate uh, from the research activity. So it goes into some pool that uh, the funder has no um, control over how the research is done at all once it goes into that, that pool. Yeah, I was just going to pick up on on something that um, Professor Fredenberg made the made the point was is it's it's also about I think drawing drawing on the evidence. So I think it's being really careful that you know your 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 partnerships or your engagement is not actually deflecting from or or concealing the fact that the actually evidence based approaches to what needs to happen to protect people um, are, are not being implemented. I think a kind of classic example here, for example, is 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 alcohol. You know, so if you if you've got absolutely no policies in place that we know are evidence based to protect the public, but you know, offering kind of corporate social responsibility campaigns or partnership is it, it, it can often conceal that actually what the, the lack is, you know, evidence based policy or interventions that we know will work and protect people. And, and so you, what you know, what you don't want is that it's actually deflecting from from things that we do know. And as colleagues have said, doing something that we know is potentially not going to bring impact either. And I, I think sometimes it's also stepping back and saying, well, actually, if, if this is even an option, sometimes what you're talking about isn't even a, a public health intervention or, or is unlikely to to benefit the benefit the public so that, that if they're willing to engage with it sometimes it's it's um it's meant that you know actually what's on the table is is not beneficial um and i think the other the other thing that i was going to to think about what what i what the other point i was going to make is also that it, it it's not a kind of license to do harm in in some other way um and i'm just thinking back to to what Salma is saying so if you're engaging with kind of partnership in one country but that same organization is then um causing harm or exporting harm elsewhere i think it's really important to look across the whole um in the whole corporation that their entire kind of repertoire of behavior and say well actually you know are we just legitimizing harm being caused in another way because we're focusing over here and I think I think it's important to really look across the kind of whole whole um, portfolio of activities as such. Uh, just to make another point that there are many uh, commercial actors other than producers of unhealthy products and they can also play a role. I'm thinking of the work of my uh, colleague Bronwyn King, uh, an uh, oncologist in Australia who has succeeded in getting uh, insurance companies to disinvest from tobacco, really by bringing pressure from organized healthcare workers to say, we don't want the company that's insuring us to be making money from tobacco that's killing our patients. And similarly, the work of uh, Bill McKibben here in the United States around persuading uh, people to disinvest from the fossil fuel industry, saying it's not in the interest of investors to be investing in an industry that's going to be losing money as well as doing harm. And uh, in, in both those cases, in tobacco and fossil fuel, uh, you know, billions and billions of dollars have been disinvested by investors who fear, you know, uh, losing money. And I think that is an example of how public health arguments can lead commercial actors to make different decisions. Uh, I want to move to to Dr. Barrow because there's a few questions uh, in the Q and A for you. But I actually, I was hoping uh, to take a little liberty and ask one myself first, which is just you talked about the cycle of uh, of bias, and I was hoping you could speak to 
what the root causes of that are and sort of what your thoughts are for tackling those potential root causes? Oh, yeah. Well, that's another big question. Um, like all of research, all of low and middle income countries. But um, yeah, so I mean, I think there's different ways to tackle the different parts. So the research agenda, let, let's deal with that one first. Uh, I think that's the hardest one to tackle, actually, because uh, commercial interests are free to fund uh, whatever they want to fund and whatever researchers they fund. Uh, so I think it's really up to uh, the users of that research to cause the change here. So if we consider uh, commercial funding for research on a particular topic a risk of bias, which I think the um, evidence is abundant for that, then when it comes to decision making, that research should be discounted in some way, just like other research with a risk of bias uh, is discounted. And so I think if users of research are much more skeptical about the funding source, that will help tackle the research agenda problem. But I mean, commercial funders are going to fund the questions that are of commercial benefit to them. That's the bottom line. And those questions do not necessarily align with public health. And so when we use that research, we need to make that decision. As far as tackling like the methods and how the research is conducted uh, behind the scenes and the publication, I mean, that falls more in the academic uh, sector. And I think there's been a lot of um, uh, movement, as I said, around transparency there that's improved that. So uh, the demand that there be full data sets available, uh, the demand that there's protocols in advance, uh, for example, that has made it much harder for commercial funders to hide research that's not to their benefit and not publish it. Um, there are some journals, for example, that won't accept research from uh, pharmaceutical companies or tobacco companies under certain conditions uh, because they have such a track record of hiding uh, data. Um, so the move towards transparency has really uh, helped to all that. Um, I mean, I do think the influence on researchers themselves is more uh, subtle because, I mean, we've done work showing that when we interview industry-funded researchers, they do acknowledge a lot of pressure from their sponsors on various parts of the research project. Um, so even if we have contracts to protect against that, I really think there needs to be a change of uh, culture. I mean, you know, like we've all been been mentioning, you know, we have this this culture in academia of, you know, it's okay to get uh, funding for wherever you can get it from because your research is so important. You just want it done. And I think that um, it becomes very difficult once researchers are embedded in that system to resist any any pressure. So we need the system itself, the universities, um, to actually uh, protect uh, in, in that regard. But I think we have made a lot of progress here, but there's still, still a ways to go and the research agenda is, is the tough part. There's two clarifying questions in the in the chat for you as well, Dr. Barrow. One is, are there any differences in methodologies used by commercially influenced studies versus the independent ones? And the second is, wouldn't commercial funders be more selective in funding work that they see as already highly likely to produce successful findings? Yeah, so the first one, it depends on what type of research you're looking at. So for example, uh, if you're looking at pharmaceutical industry funded research, they're pretty much all designed as randomized uh, control trials for questions of efficacy and for post-marketing studies, many of which don't need to be done at all, but they're designed more as observational studies. So uh, the study design tends to go with the, the question. So the bias in the question will drive the design. I'm doing some work now around the cannabis industry and uh, the cannabis industry actually funds a lot of randomized controlled trials um, uh, with the question of you know, efficacy of cannabis products. Um, they don't tend to fund big observational studies of harm. Um, so, so that's linked to the, um, the study designs uh, tend to be linked to the question. And where we've seen more um, bias introduced in the process is how the study of a particular design is actually conducted and then whether it gets published or not. Um, so, so that's how that fits into the cycle of bias. Um, and the second question, you know, I, I think it just, well, of course, commercial uh, sponsors will use the justification that they're asking um, a question that 
you know, is they're likely to find a positive answer. I mean, all funders actually say they do that. They don't want to waste their money. They want to fund something that they think will answer an important question. It's just that the questions that the commercial sponsors are funding are the ones that relate to the commercial benefit of their product uh, or the commercial benefit to them of their, their product, whether it be related to harm or efficacy. And again, those questions might not be relevant to public health. So if I'm outside of the company, you know, is that a justification? Is it a justification for a company to ask a, only questions that help their bottom line when we have some other public health questions about harm, for example, and how we would prevent that harm uh, that need to be answered? There's one other question in the chat I wanna get to, and then I'm hoping to do a very quick little lightning round to get everybody uh, to throw us forward into the next few years and get everybody chatting once more. But um, this question is specifically political, social slash commercial determinants of health are all aimed at the consumer. What responsibility does the consumer play in determining her health? Dr. Van Schelwek, that, that sort of uh, prompted the, your discussion of problem definitions in my head. I'm curious if you'd feel comfortable taking that one. Sure, no, I, I think that's a, that's, I mean, we've had such great questions actually. Um, so I think this comes down to, I mean, that, that we could we could have a whole evening talking about about that and the kind of agency of, of, of individuals as well. I think what's so important and thinking about, um, the, you know, the kind of focus on my talk on, on the way we think um, and the way we, uh, the problem definitions as, as you were saying, Nick, is, I think we can't underestimate, and it's not always an easy thing to kind of think about individually, is actually what 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 it what shapes our choices. Um, and so I think in actually to have a, have a decent conversation to talk about, you know, what is the role of individuals, it's really understanding, you know, right from childhood right up to adulthood is 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 what 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 has shaped your health, but also what what's shaping your everyday choices and actually how um how many of those choices you you need to make quickly um, without thinking very quickly because that's how we get through the day and often I think particularly when we talk about things like personal responsibility and personal choice I often make the you know the kind of analogy that we've we've almost got this you know extreme um uh you know inequitable distribution on those who have the ability to kind of shape those choices and actually you know the burden of individual responsibility that's often um, placed on on individuals. So a kind of inequitable distribution of the burden of personal responsibility, I think, is is a is a kind of useful way of thinking about it. And often you hear it from those who are least subjected to having to make so many um, difficult choices. So if I think about like those who are really surrounded by all the advertising, surrounded by all the unhealthy products, exposed to the unhealthy environments, they're then the ones we always kind of really kind of, it's almost like an othering when we talk about personal responsibility. So I think that's really important is actually the, you know, the differences in, in the, in, in the, um, in the choices that we we have and then the other thing I would say a little bit about that is then thinking a bit back to to maybe talk about advocacy that we've been talking about earlier and earlier in the program is a lot of our health promotion um, is very much driven at improving people's what you know what what we often say is kind of personal choices or making better choices um, and I'm often very intrigued by the fact that we don't see health information as empowering people to um, you know in, in also incorporating um, what you know the policies that they need for to improve their health and I, I'm very interested some I think it's on the New Zealand uh, uh, websites from their health department I can't remember which topics but if you go down to the bottom it tells it tells you all the WHO best buys these are the policies you need to make better you know to be able to be healthy and that's very rare um, and so we talk about people making better choices but we don't tell them the policies that they should be advocating for coming back to what what Nicholas Frodenberg was saying you know about you know why can't we empower people to be more active so that they can actually have the choices they need? So I hope I hope that was useful and a different way of kind of a different take on it. I'm interested to see what colleagues say. Yeah, does anybody have a response to that before we move on to the quick lightning round? Okay, uh, not seeing anybody unmuting. I am going to move on to the lightning round with the last uh, few minutes that we have left. I think we have just about four minutes. So. Um, 
This conversation was super, super interesting. I hope the audience found it interesting uh, as well. I want to, you know, we've been talking sort of not, not necessarily philosophically, not, you know, maybe epistemologically about some of these things. And I want to just sort of like bring it back to sort of the policy and the concrete and the future of this field. And I was curious for each of the uh, panelists take on, you know, if there was, if you were able to have sort of one call to action to this field, if you had your druthers and there was one topic that you'd want to see more research on or a pressing question that you want the commercial determinants of health field to answer in the next, say, five years, what what would that be? What is your, I'm curious for each of your sort of call to action to this field. <laughs> Dr. Well, Freud, I'll take that on first. I think there needs to be a public outcry, actually. So uh, a call to action to me is really uh, on all of us who work in this area to uh, somehow get our message effectively across to the public so that they're outraged about this because uh, and that there's this power and this level of influence uh, going on 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 their health and their lives. And I think that's what's really going to move us forward to to change. Um, I think. I think commercial actors will always do what they were designed to do, which is make profit. Uh, I think because of that, we need to know that how do we intervene at political level and at a population level to actually rein in those commercial entities? I, I think it's great to keep to to talk about uh, commercial responsibility, and and we can engage with 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 commercial actors on this. But I think it's ultimately our responsibility is to actually use the political system to make sure that we rein in commercial interest when it comes to harming um, population health. And I guess because I was speaking about low income countries, I hope that as the field advances, we need to have trade agreements as a central part of the conversation about commercial determinants of health. I think I find that the biggest obstacle is people's belief that it's not possible to do anything to change it. And in the speaking and uh, teaching and interacting with other folks, I find a surprising number of people agree that things aren't working, that they have a hard time finding healthy food, affordable housing, safe work, uh, that the skepticism about the current form of capitalism, uh, public opinion polls, and you know, reading the newspaper shows it's pretty high, especially among young people. And so I think my advice is look around you, you know, look at all the people who are dissatisfied and looking to take action and actually taking action. I think the, you know, the slogan of the women's movement of a few decades ago that the personal is political and the political is personal, have people encourage people to look at their own lives and to what extent their needs are being satisfied, our society feels fulfilling, and then look at the people who are working for change, the young people, the Black and Latino people, the immigrants, you know, talking about this country. Uh, and, and how can we support that work in order to create a healthier, you know, a more uh, integrated, holistic uh, community? That would be my plea. I find it very, very difficult to add to that. I mean, all three have said, all three of your speakers have said exactly um, how, how I feel. I very much echo. I think I just have to say, we can't do this um, without emotion and without vision. So I think, you know, things like film, things like art, thing, you know, exhibitions on, you know, documents, films about this, um, other ways in which we can really bring it to life and have emotion and vision for people I think is also really important and I, I think you know that that's that's been the success um, of, of industry has often been giving people visions and 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 things to connect to um, I think I think this will be really important um, in in actually kind of driving this agenda forward as well and with that uh, I'm going to turn it back over to Dean Galea thank you all for an incredible discussion I feel like I learned a lot and judging by the comments in the chat and the Q&A, it seems like the audience did too. So Dean Galea, back to you. Well, thank you, Nick. The, um, the, the extraordinary privilege of being able to host a meeting like this is to be able to host a meeting like this. The downside is I'm dying to ask questions and to engage with some of the things our speakers said, and I don't get to do that. Um, what a terrific panel. Thank you, uh, Lisa, Salma, May, Nick, and Nick. 
Um, uh, I, I learned from you today, as I do always from your read, uh, from your writing and from listening to you. And thank you to the audience. We had some outstanding questions from the audience and outstanding comments in the chat. Um, everybody, thank you for caring about this issue, for uh, everything you do for health. Everybody have a good afternoon and a good evening. Take good care.